have in our audience, um, how many of you are patients or patients' family members? Great. Any physicians or therapists? Great. Okay. Well, this is a talk that I've, I've given in various forms a number of times. Um, and uh, I've given it primarily to doctors, but I now have a new perspective on it because I recently was a patient. Um, and uh, so hopefully I'll be able to give you some insight. I had a big thoracic disc pressing on my spinal cord two months ago, and I was lucky enough to uh, have a problem that could be surgically corrected, so I underwent a six-hour surgery to correct it, and I'm now doing fine and, and was cured. Unfortunately, many of you all that are patients or patients' families uh, have problems that may not be uh, amenable to something as miraculous as that and are left with a lot of... Uh, uh, significant impairments afterwards. And one of the impairments that can be most disabling is spasticity or disorders of muscle tone, which we'll talk about um, today. Um, the good news is that this is one of the most treatable types of impairments. And so I'll, I'll talk uh, about ways we, we have to treat it. And there's a lot of new technology that's uh, come in the last decade or so that makes it much better to treat spasticity than it used to be with fewer side effects and more effective treatments. Um, I didn't introduce myself really. I'm Sam Mayer. I'm uh, in the uh, Department of Physical Medicine Rehab over at Hopkins and uh, direct the inpatient program among a number of other things that I do in the department. So in this talk, we're going to define different abnormalities of muscle tone uh, briefly. We're going to primarily talk about one abnormality, which is probably the most common in people with transverse myelitis or uh, other uh, neuroimmunologic disorders, which is spasticity. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to talk about ways that we assess tone, and we're going to talk about tone that is generalized, meaning affecting most of the muscles in the body, versus more localized tone, because the treatments are very different. And we'll talk about new treatments that there are for, for spasticity. So different types of muscle tone um, problems. Rigidity is a problem where there's a constant increase in muscle tone. The muscles are tight all the time, irrespective of how you move them. Spasticity, on the other hand, is what we call rate-dependent. And what that means is the faster you pull on a muscle, the more tight it gets. Dystonia is a persistent problem with muscle tone. It's actually used often as a more general term for all abnormalities of muscle tone, but it also refers to a more specific one in which a limb may be in, tightened in a particular position uh, where the muscles are contracting all the time. And myofascial pain is what people commonly call muscle spasms when they talk about back aches or things like that. And, of course, people with uh, impairments from neuroimmunologic disorders can also get these types of uh, spasms as well. And we have to sort through what's just a regular run-of-the-mill muscle spasm versus one from a neurologic problem. Part of the way we distinguish between these is we look at where in the nervous system the problem is. So with rigidity, the problem is deep in the brain, in areas of the brain that we call the basal ganglia, which are deep areas of the brain. Um, spasticity, on the other hand, can happen in any of a few locations in the central nervous system. It can happen on the outer layers of the brain. It can happen in the brain stem, that portion of the brain that connects the brain to the spinal cord, and in the spinal cord itself. Dystonia can happen from disorders in the brain stem as well, um, or it can be um, a local muscle problem, and it's not very well understood. And even less understood is, is this whole problem of myofascial pain, even though it's an incredibly pr common problem, we don't really understand it. In some cases, it has been linked to central nervous system disorders. Uh, for example, a disorder called Arne arnold Chiari malformation, which is... Uh, when the brain kind of uh, herniates down into the spinal column. 
Um, but it probably, in most cases, is more of a localized muscle problem. Next thing is clinicians that we try to figure out is whether the problem is a mechanical problem with the muscle causing a tight contracture or loss of range of motion in the joint or whether it's due to spasticity. And most often what we see is a combination of the two, but we have to sort through how much is from one versus the other. What happens when you're spastic is over time the muscle itself contracts down and tightens and causes a mechanical problem. So ways we distinguish that. A mechanical problem is fixed. The, mus the joint won't move at all because the muscle and the tendons and the surrounding tissues of the joint are so tight. It can involve the tendons of the muscles or the ligaments that attach the bones of the joint together. Um, sometimes it involves what we call a Charcot joint. When there's an absent sensation to the joint, the joint gets damaged by arthritis, and that can cause a contracture. Um, sometimes there's a condition called heterotopic ossification, which is kind of a mouthful, but it's an abnormal growth of bone into the muscle, and that commonly happens in neurologic conditions, and we have to look for that too. On the other hand, spastic contractures are dynamic, meaning that they change depending on position or how much tongue there is in the muscle at the given time. You can slowly stretch it out. Because we discussed earlier, spasticity is rate dependent. So if we stretch a muscle more slowly, it'll stretch out. Um, we can palpate the muscles. We can feel the muscles opposite the contracture and see if they're contracting as well. And that gives us an idea that it's a spastic problem, which is a problem when muscle groups fight each other, essentially. And we can look at... Uh, reflexes, you know, with a hammer, and, and look what happens with the, the hammer, and people with spasticity have increased reflexes in general. And as I said, most often both of these conditions are present. So most of the patients I see have both these problems, and we kind of have to simultaneously treat both. So how do we assess muscle tone? Well, like anything in medicine, what we want to do is get a good history and a good examination is where we start, and that's the core of what we do. There's fancier ways of assessing it, but frankly, they're not as good as, as just asking the right questions and examining the, the person the right way. It tells us more than anything. There are some new measurement tools, uh, which are primarily used for research, frankly, um, and used somewhat in the clinical setting, but not necessarily. Um, so, key questions that we as physicians want to ask is, first of all, where is the problem? So, is it a problem that involves uh, just the hands, for example, or is it a problem, you know, more generalized? Uh, we want to know what time of day it's worse, what are the aggravating factors, things that make it worse, things that make it better. Uh, Encouraging our patients to keep a diary about that is, is very helpful, too, so we can try to figure out what makes it better and what makes it worse and get some ideas of how to lessen the problem. Are there painful spasms with it? Uh, many, if not most people with spasticity, have quite a bit of pain associated with it. Some people don't have pain, depending on what's causing the spasticity. But uh, if it is painful, obviously that's something that we want to treat more aggressively. Whereas if it's not painful and not interfering with things, then we're not as likely to treat it. Which gets to the next question, which is probably the most important question, is how is it affecting your function? We want to sort through whether this problem is, is limiting you as a patient or whether it uh, is just an annoyance or something that happens to be a finding on examination but doesn't impact your life. Um, there's a tendency sometimes among doctors to just try to treat a patient based on some findings on physical exam, and we really need to talk to patients and assess them in terms of how it's Im impacting them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about this some more, but spasticity can be a good thing in some patients. Um, 
particularly in patients who are still um, ambulatory um, and are weak in their legs, they often need the muscle tone in their legs to stand, to transfer, and to walk. And we don't want to take away that because it's good tone that's compensating for weak muscles. Um, so that's a very important thing we need to distinguish when we're treating patients with spasticity. So physical exam, we, we of course want to do a neurologic exam on someone. Um, we want to also assess their range of motion, how their joints move. We want to feel if there are tender areas or areas that trigger spasms. Um, we want to check for something called clonus, which is a shaking, usually at, at the ankle, sometimes at the, um, the wrist, where if you push the joint back, it'll shake. Um, that can also happen spontaneously. Um, and there's something called an Ashworth scale, which is kind of a gross measurement that we use uh, for uh, spasticity. And this is the scale that we use. Um, those of you that are physicians in the room will, will instantly see that this is not a very scientific way of uh, describing things, but it uh, is more of a descriptive uh, terminology that we use that we can communicate with one another and that we can track symptoms over time and see how effective our treatments are. Um, there are fancier ways that we can measure spasticity. Um, and as I said earlier, these are largely research tools, so not necessarily something that you'll, you know, when you go and see your, your physician, they'll be doing on a routine basis, but they may do it if there's some clinical trial they're doing and so forth. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with this unless some um, physicians in the audience are interested later. Um, they can ask me questions about this. Um, it gets rather technical, and I'm not sure that for this audience it's worthwhile getting into. But um, there's various ways that we can uh, kind of more quantitatively look at spasticity and, and give a number to it. Getting to treatment. Um, we used to have a way of treating spasticity that wasn't very effective before we had new tools. And a lot of uh, physicians are still of this old mindset, and what I'm going to propose is a little bit newer way, a new paradigm for treating things. So the old way of treating things was kind of a stepwise approach. We looked at things and we said, we'll go from the least invasive thing that we could do, the least harmful thing we could do, to the most aggressive or most uh, invasive way of treating it. Um, so we would start off with using what's called modalities, heat and cold, sometimes electrical stimulation. Then we'd use medications by mouth, typically, thinking that they had less side effects than doing other things, which isn't necessarily true, but we'll talk about that. Um, then doing injections. Um, and in the past, we had limited things that we could inject. Now we have much better things that we have available to inject. Then we'd go do surgery on patients and release their tendons, uh, have the orthopedic surgeons do that. And finally, if that didn't work, we'd get the neurosurgeon involved and we'd have them cut their nerves. Um, and it was kind of a archaic way of viewing things and very um, uh, rigid way of looking at things. The new approach is more individualized the patient, really looking what's going on with a given patient and trying to tailor things. So the first question we ask is whether the spasticity is generalized or localized. So does it involve most of the body or just a few joints? Um, you know, is it localized to the hand or is it something that affects all four limbs or the trunk? Figuring out where it's coming from. So is it a problem in the brain? Is it a problem in the spinal cord? Because the treatments are different. Looking at how recent the problem is. Is it a problem that just started? Is it an acute problem? Or is it a more chronic problem that's been around for years? And then taking all these factors into account and getting a treatment paradigm from that. So looking at patients who have more generalized spasticity, the approach we take is first we look at are there things that are triggering it? 
So are there what we call nociceptive factors, like irritations, uh, things like a urinary tract infection or a, a pressure sore can uh, trigger spasticity. And we want to get rid of those things first because they're usually the easiest things, and if we don't get rid of them, they're going to continue to be a problem in terms of triggering spasticity. Then we want to do things that are relatively simple but can actually do a lot for most patients. So things like stretching, we also splint joints because if there's a mechanical contracture there, we have to stretch it out for a prolonged period of time. Just stretching it once or twice a day isn't going to fix it. So splinting, uh, positioning people properly um, in their wheelchairs or in their beds or um, in their shoes, whatever that involves. Um, using modalities as well, so ice, cold, electricity. Then oral medication has a role for many of these patients, but we have to be careful because oral medication has a lot of side effects. And so for patients who can't take the oral meds, then we look at what's called intrathecal medication, using a special pump to inject the medicine in close to the spinal cord and uh, enabling us to provide the medicine that way. And then lastly, there are some neurosurgical procedures that are rarely done but uh, can be helpful for some patients who don't respond to anything else. So oral medications, there's a few uh, medications that are commonly used. There's some other ones less commonly used that I won't go into. But probably the most commonly used uh, is baclofen. It's an old medication that's been around uh, maybe 30 years. Um, it binds certain uh, neuroreceptors in the spinal cord. Um, main side effects are that it causes generalized weakness and lethargy. Um, and this can be a huge problem. So that um, at doses that it takes to control the spasticity, it may already make people too weak to stand up or to sit up. Um, it also has a problem that if you withdraw it quickly, if you stop the medicine quickly because there's a side effect or you happen to run out from your pharmacy, it can cause seizures and even death in that case. So we have to be careful with it. Dantrolene is another medication. This medication doesn't actually work on the nervous system, it works on the muscle uh, and blocks what's called the calcium channels in the muscle. Um, it uh, doesn't cause any drowsiness, but it does cause significant weakness, actually even more weakness than the baclofen in some cases. So it's not good for people who need to stand or need to walk. Um, it's sometimes a good medication for people who are uh, unable to use anything but a wheelchair um, and un don't have much active muscle movement. So it, it may be good for some of those patients. It can also cause some liver problems, so we have to watch that as well. Uh, tizanidine is the newest of these agents, although it's also been around about 10 years. Um, and it works in a little different way. Um, it too can cause uh, a lethargy like baclofen. It causes a problem called orthostasis, which means that if you get up quickly, your blood pressure drops and can make you pass out. And it commonly causes dry mouth. When we have trouble with using these medications, and we frequently do, um, one option for patients with generalized spasticity is an intrathecal baclofen pump, um, which is a, a pretty new technology in the last decade or so, um, in which we inject uh, the medicine direct into the spinal cord. And the way we do this is there's a pump that sits in your abdomen. It looks kind of like a pacemaker. It's about the size of a hockey puck and it has a catheter that goes up into the spinal column and then injects the medicine right in the space in the, between the uh, layers of the spinal cord. Um, it uh, is nice because it's infinitely adjustable, so we can give a higher dose during some times of the day and a lower dose during other times of the day. If, for example, you only have problems at night with spasms, but during the day you need that tone, we can give a higher dose at night. Um, it does, uh, it is affected by gravity because it's injecting into the spinal fluid and when you are up and upright, it tends to drift down towards the lower part of the spinal cord and affect the legs more than the arms. So people who have a lot of spasticity in their arms but not their legs, this 
is sometimes not the best treatment for. Um, the uh, pump has to be refilled. On this slide, I have every one to four months, but actually the newer pumps, the brand new pumps, are twice as large, so you can double those numbers. Um, they have big, bigger gas tanks in them, so to speak, although they're the same size, they, have, they fit more medicine. So uh, now it's every two to eight months, or in some cases even a year, that it has to be refilled. Um, and there's some risk of infection and, and mal mechanical malfunction that uh, can be fairly significant, and we have to be careful about that. Uh, so it's not for everyone. For people with more localized spasticity, these are people who have spasticity in one limb, sometimes two limbs, but usually only a, one or two or three joints. Um, we take a little different approach because we don't want to give them the big guns that affect the whole body. We want to treat the problem where it's at. Um, so again, we want to do some of the same things that we do for generalized spasticity. So take away all those irritating factors. We want to do the local uh, splinting and, and stretching, uh, bracing. Um, we can also do some stretching with ultrasound treatments for physical therapy. Um, where they heat the, the muscle tendon and it stretches better is, is uh, one effective way of stretching it. Um, then we want to think, you know, is this an acute problem or is it more a chronic problem? Uh, and also what size muscle it is. So for more acute problems that are more recent in the onset and also for problems that involve smaller muscles, we use botulinum toxin which is the same stuff that you've heard about for wrinkles. It's a muscle relaxant that lo works locally on the, where the nerves and muscle meet at the myoneural junction. Um, and there's actually two different ones that are on the market. One is Botox, which you've probably heard about on TV. One's a little lesser known, uh, different type of botulinum toxin called myoblock, but um, they're very similar to each other. Um, and then if we have a more chronic problem that involves particularly bigger muscles in the legs, we use what's called phenol, which is actually a very simple chemical that's commonly used in industrial purposes and used all the time in medical research labs. Um, but it, it uh, essentially uh, semi-permanently destroys the muscle, nerve muscle endings there that um, allows the, the treatment to last for much longer. Um, and so it, it's a semi-permanent solution, so it can last a year or more. Um, and lastly, if those things don't work and we get progressive mechanical uh, contracture, then we look at having tendon surgery to release the uh, contracture. Um, yeah. So talking about phenol first, um, when we inject phenol, one of the things that we have to watch out for is it affects both what's called the motor and the sensory fibers. Motor are the muscle fibers, and the sensory are the sensation, so the sense of feeling. The problem with that is that if you do a mixed nerve that has both motor and sensory fibers, you may get problems with sensation. It may make for numbness, or worse yet, it can cause some painful problems with uh, what we call dysesthesias. Uh, or painful electric shock sensations. Um, usually what we do is, is either inject a pure motor nerve or we inject the nerve endings as they meet the muscle. We have to carefully find those. Uh, and there's some techniques for doing that with, uh, with measuring things with the needle and some electricity. Um, and the treatment lasts typically around six months um, but I've got patients who go a year between injections. Um, some patients, it only lasts four months, but it's usually much longer acting. It also happens to be much less expensive. The medication is much less expensive than Botox, which is another advantage to it. Um, there's a couple different ways of, uh, of injecting these things to get it in the muscle. Um, again, since the audience is primarily... Uh, patients and their families. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but if, if uh, some of the physicians in the audience want to catch me later and we can talk about this, and I think they'll talk about it a little bit in the workshops as well, some of the techniques for doing these right. Um,
the botulinum toxins have the advantage that they only affect the muscles essentially, so we don't have to worry about sensation afterwards. Um, they can be injected a little more cavalierly for that reason, so that we can just inject them in the right muscle um, without having to worry the exact location within that muscle that we're injecting. Um, and they last typically anywhere from two to five months. Um, we can use A or B. They're very similar. Um, a has been around a lot longer, um, so we have now, uh, what is it, 17 years of experience with it. It originally was approved, it's kind of an interesting story, it was approved for a very rare condition called blepharospasm, which is a uh, twitching of the eyelid. Um, and was approved by the FDA as an orphan drug, uh, which is a much quicker approval process and costs the drug company a lot less money. And since that time, it has been used for everything uh, from as you know, wrinkles to uh, problems with the esophagus, problems with anal fissures to uh, spasticity and, and a whole host of other problems, headaches, back pain. So the, the drug company did quite well with this product. Um, it typically lasts about three months, give or take. It comes in a little vial. It's frozen, and the doctor has to mix it up. Um, Botulinum toxin B, which is mild black, um, has uh, also been around uh, a fair amount of time now, since 1999. Um, it did uh, recently switch uh, from one pharmaceutical company to another, and the drug was bought by another pharmaceutical company. And so there's a little less experience on the part of the drug company in terms of marketing this. And so fewer doctors have heard about it. Um, so it's used a lot less often. Uh, it's been used for torticollis, which is a twisting of the neck, and other dystonias. That's originally what it was used for. Um, it may last slightly longer. There's some evidence of that, but that's a little controversial as well. Um, and it comes pre-mixed. Um, so Botox has approval for using in dystonias, and it's been used in a whole host of other things, has approval for using in, in wrinkles as well. It is not FDA approved, though, for spasticity, interestingly enough, even though that's one of the most common uses, and there's tons of uh, evidence that it works uh, in the scientific literature. Um, about 3% of the people will get antibodies to it with prolonged use, and that means that after you've been using it a while, you can't use it anymore because it doesn't do anything. And so we have to watch that. And that's actually the usual reason that we switch to the botulinum toxin B, because you become resistant to the A, and there's no cross-reaction there. Um, and that's how it's primarily been studied, the botulinum toxin B. Um, one of the problems with botulinum toxin B is it does tend to cause some more dry mouth than botulinum toxin A as a side effect. Sometimes it's a good thing. If we have patients who have trouble with a lot of drooling, um, we can treat the drooling with this um, as, as a useful side effect. Um, and it may also be more associated with trouble swallowing as a side effect, and so we have to watch that. We have to watch that with Botox as well, but it's more frequent with the mild block. Um, so I want to just briefly, uh, you know, actually we're running a little over time. I'm going to skip these cases, but we can maybe discuss them later. Um, but are there any questions? <laughs>